Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence here this morning. Lord Jesus, we welcome you. Father God, we welcome you into this place. Lord, as we dig in your word today, just come and speak to us, Lord. Let your word pierce our heart. Let it transform us. Let it grow us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We welcome you here. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, We've been spending the last few weeks, as summer came to an end, kind of looking at uh, vineyard values. You know, the vineyard's a lot bigger than us. It's a movement of churches, uh, about 600 across the country, about 2,000 across the world, I guess. Um, And what brings us together are a set of values. And so we've been looking at those values and how they uh, interact with our church. Uh, We opened up with a phrase a few weeks ago, this phrase of everyone gets to play, this idea that everyone has an opportunity to minister. Ministry is not just for... Uh, the clergy, it's for everyone. And we're, we should be able to operate within the giftings, within the callings, within the things the Lord has placed into our lives and into our hearts. And from there we moved into the kind of the theology of the vineyard, which is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. This idea of the reign and rule of God, that when Jesus came, he announced the kingdom, that God's reign and rule was coming present, that God was about to set things straight. Now it didn't fully come, it only came in part, we'll we'll experience the fullness of that upon Jesus' return. But until then, we still have these moments where we experience God's reign, God's rule come and and begin to set things right. We see that when people come to the Lord, and all of a sudden they're born again. They're they're moving from one kingdom to another kingdom. We see that uh, when we pray for people and people get healed, when when people experience uh, breakthrough in their life. It's this picture of the kingdom coming. And to do that, we looked at these values. The the first one was this idea of partnering with the Holy Spirit, how we're trying to follow the Holy Spirit and what he's doing. Jesus said he only does what he sees the Father do, and so that's our goal as well, to to pay attention, to try to see uh, what the Lord is doing, what the Holy Spirit is doing. And I kind of use that description as as looking for the wind. We're trying to see where the wind is at, move uh, with the wind, so to speak, uh, of the Spirit. Let the Spirit lead us and drive us. Uh, The second value we looked at was worshiping and experiencing God, this this idea uh, of intimacy with the Father, of being in his presence. As we're in his presence, we experience uh, his power. And through that, worship is a lot more than just what we do here, but it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Last week, we looked at um, compassionate ministry. How, How, as we're following Jesus into what he's doing, he's he's ministering to people, usually the disenfranchised, usually the poor. Uh, We we looked at um, Isaiah 61, as Jesus uh, quoted that to announce his ministry. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me to to preach the good news to the poor, to release the prisoner. And so that's the call on us. And I loved, you know, we've been asking somebody to come up every week and kind of talk about how this value affects them. And John came up last week, and I I know for John, uh, just that that picture of compassionate ministry, it's what drives him, but it's also the thing that brought him into the kingdom. You know, the least of these. And how the Lord came and rescued him from his situation and, and just completely turned his life upside down. Now, today's value can seem a bit odd and confusing. We look at the other values, and even next week's, and they make total sense. You see where we're coming from. But this one, uh, this one's called being a reconciling community. And that's a weird one. Because we hear that, and at initial thought, we're not exactly sure uh, what that means. What does it mean to be a reconciling community? Why is it important? And it's really easy to skip over this. But in reality, this is an incredibly important value. It helps us understand the why of a lot of the things we do. Why uh, do we do ministry? Why do we do outreach? Why are we at the AYSO fields on Saturday mornings? Why do we do missions uh, in Puerto Rico and, and, and elsewhere? 
Why do we do the things that we do? Why in the past did we minister to the poor through a food pantry? Why have we, you know, have we done things? To understand this value, though, we really need to dig into some scripture. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5 quite a bit today. When we come to Christianity, when we come to faith, we tend to come to faith for very selfish reasons. We're concerned about our eternal destiny, right? What happens to us when we die? For many of us, that's what, what brought us to the faith. Are you going to go to heaven and hell? What, what is judgment going to look like? I mean, many of us have probably at one time or another heard a fire and brimstone preacher basically say, you know, if, you're, if you don't know Jesus, you're sinning, you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn, but the only way to be saved, the only way to get to heaven is to give your life to Christ. If you invite Jesus into your life, you become born again, and now you're, you're going to heaven, you're not going to hell, and salvation has come to your life. And for many of us, we, that's what we've heard. That's the, the understanding that we have. And there's a place for that understanding. If, if you look at uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, starting in chapter 4 and verse 16, there's beautiful quotes like this. Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are be being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We have this picture in our mind that, that as we, we accept Jesus into our lives, we know our future is guaranteed, our future in heaven. So the troubles and the tribulations of this world are nothing in comparison to the glory that we're going to uh, experience in the future. This promise of eternal life. It, it, it shifts our focus from what's happening now and we begin to focus on what will happen. What heaven could be like. Paul continues these ideas in chapter 5, verse 4. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, a guaranteeing what is to come. We, we, we understand that the Holy Spirit, as we experience the Spirit, it, it's, a, it's a promise. A promise of what He's going to do in the future, of what, what will be accomplished. So as the Spirit operates in our life, we have these moments of life and begins to give us this, fo this focus on the future. And I've heard so many people talk things like this, like, you know, one day this body, I'm not going to have to deal with it anymore. The aches, the pains. We did work day here yesterday. And uh, I'm, I, I'm always more optimistic of what I'm able to accomplish than what my body is able to accomplish. And one of the side projects that I gave myself was to move a bunch of metal chairs that we inherited as a church uh, to the basement next door in the house. Uh, we, we created a room that we were using for storage. We're making it into a, a self-serve nursery. So I had about 80 metal folding chairs. And I just grabbed four at a time and walked up the stairs, crossed the driveway, down the stairs, and back and forth and back and forth for about an hour, hour and a half, just nonstop, nonstop. Because I can do things like this, right? And then I made the mistake of sitting down. And this, this earthly body just locked up. And, and I tried to move around. And, and by last night, I was walking around the house like an old man because everything was just seizing up and all my joints and my things. And, and Ben was looking at me at home and saying, why'd you do that? Well, you know, why, why, why did you do that? It wasn't even on the punch list of things we wanted to get accomplished. But it was there, and I could do it. I could do it. 
We all have moments like that, and we realize that there's so much in our body that just doesn't work. And one day, one day, and we focus on that one day. And Paul tells us that, that one day we'll experience that new life. One day. And so all of a sudden, our whole focus shifts in that case. And we start thinking, how am I going to get to heaven? Am I good with God? And we've developed all kinds of teachings and theologies that underline that. And and it's become a fascination for many of us, right? What's going to happen when we die? What happens at the end times? What will heaven be like? I've heard tremendous teachings on heaven. To be blunt, there's not a whole lot. There's some in here that describes heaven. Some beautiful pictures of the throne room in Revelations. But I've heard all kinds of stories. My mom, who uh, was Roman Catholic and grew up uh, just with all kinds of uh, Roman Catholic traditions as well as Polish traditions, and there were all kinds of ideas of what heaven was going to be like. And as I've read the book, I haven't seen any of those. She believed that we were going to be 33, we'll all be 33 when we go to heaven, because that was Jesus when he got resurrected. And I I think when you're older and you think 33 sounds good, unless things weren't good when you were 33, and then you're like, man, I don't know if I want to be 33. There's a fascination about that. And many of us, we get stuck in that fascination. We think that the entire reason we do all of this is that hope of heaven. That is the good news in our mind. There's something after this, something better than this. And what occurs is that focus, it motivates us, it changes us, it sets our values and our priorities and our actions. And we begin to focus on us, right? What do I need to to do to make sure I'm good with God, to make sure that I get to heaven? And if we're missional, that becomes our message to other people. You need to do these things so that you can get good with God, so that you can get to heaven. And it seems like that's the focus of everything. It becomes our motivation. When I was younger, there was an old uh, audio adrenaline tune that cracked me up. Uh, it was basically what, what happens. It was called uh, DC-10, I think it was. And the song's question was really simple. Uh, where would you go if a DC-10 fell on your head? This is deep theological thought here, okay? okay. And, and for many of us, that's how we present the gospel. We become heaven-focused. You're either in, you're out. And then after a while, it turns into an us-versus-them mentality, doesn't it? You know, we've prayed the prayer. We go to church. We're good. The rest of them, they haven't. They've rejected God. They're heathens. They're sin- uh, sinners. They're enemy of God. And, and before you know it, we act towards others especially those who don't look like us or act like us or sound like us or believe like us or do the things we like to do. Uh, We look at them like we don't care anymore. And it's almost like we're saying to them, you know, to hell with y'all. Actually, we are saying to them, to hell with y'all. And we get comfortable there because the good news is all about heaven. And then we read something like this. Verse 6, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due the things that we have done while in the body, whether good or bad. Paul's reinforcing the heaven uh, motive here, but he's also telling us that our lives need to be focused different. They need to be focused on pleasing Jesus. So this isn't just about saying a prayer, and I'm not dismissing that. This isn't about doing good deeds. I'm not saying that that's how you get to heaven. But, but part of following Jesus is obedience to Jesus. See, 
in the context that Paul's writing, all of a sudden our action, our actions become important. So what exactly is he is he telling us to do here? See, in this section, Paul wants us to think differently. And he starts it in verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves uh, to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are all convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now step back for a second. Paul is saying something interesting here. He's saying that, that life is about dealing with eternal destiny. It's not just our destiny. It's eternal destiny of everyone around us. This is serious stuff now. If, if, if heaven and hell is a real thing, if there's such a thing as judgment, then that should sober us up really quick. That should sober us. It should put both fear and deep concern into our lives. I mean, if we do believe that by, by accepting Jesus into our hearts, by, by claiming He is our Lord and Savior, by following Him, we will have eternal life one day, then that means that we do understand that there is a judgment coming. And that judgment should sober us. Because for some reason, we're going to get through that judgment, not by what we have done, but by what Christ has done. And when we realize the, the, the enormity of that, it should sober us as we're looking at people around us. It should break our heart as we're looking at people around us, realizing the number of people who, who aren't going to pass through that judgment. You know, did we deserve the grace that we received? I mean, how impressive is our holiness in comparison to God? It's not. And Paul's looking at them and saying, you know, there are a lot of people who criticize us. And they're being criticized, Paul and the rest of the apostles, for not acting the way some of the false apostles are acting. Not walking with that, that, that sense of importance. See, as we go throughout all of Scripture, we notice something interesting, the way Paul defends himself. He keeps on saying things like, you know, I didn't come to you with wise words, I wasn't impressive, uh, you know, I, I didn't show off on who I was. Paul wouldn't make a good TV personality. Paul wouldn't make a TikToker. He wasn't impressive. He didn't look pretty. He wasn't a social influencer in any way, shape, or form. And then Paul had this other issue. He always got in trouble. I don't know if you like read Acts, but like Paul would go into a city and, you know, say some things, and then a riot would break out. You know, there are only a couple of things that a Roman citizen could get locked up for. Um, you know, he murdered someone or something like that, or started a riot. And Paul had this uncanny ability to start riots just by preaching the gospel. Now compare that to the false prophets, right? They, they had these impressive ministries. They gathered crowds around them. They were able to say things that tickled people's ears, that they wanted to hear. They encouraged them. The authorities enjoyed them. There were no problems. No one got arrested. It was good. In comparison to them, Paul looks foolish. But Paul's motivation wasn't about building his brand. It wasn't about building his image or building his ministry. Paul's motivation 
was out of the love of Christ. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Think about Paul's story for a second. Jesus literally stops him in his tracks. Paul's on the road to Damascus, right? And this is a road that leads to hell for him. Because he thinks he's pleasing God, but he's not. He's in full rebellion of God. He's actually trying to stop God's plans. So the path that he's on is a path straight to hell. And, and Jesus doesn't just like gently say, hey, Paul, maybe you should do things a little different. He knocks him off that path. Just completely whammo. Now, we'd love to stay there, but there are a couple other incidents that occurred that, that dramatically affect Paul's life. Because you can say, you know, Paul or Jesus converts Paul right there on the road to Damascus, and everything is fixed there. But there's things that occur later. After he gets off the road, what does Jesus tell him to do? Go see Ananias. So he's blind, he goes to Ananias. Ananias sees who's knocking at his door, and what does Ananias do? He turns around and goes, uh, Lord... You know who's at my door right now? Have you not heard about this guy? This guy Saul? You know what he's done to the other churches and he's here. We, we could take him out. The Lord says, no. Pray for him. I, I love the pray for him because he's about to find out the level, level of suffering he will have to go through to follow me. That, that, I love that line. We should tattoo that on ourselves. You know, Lord, show me the level of suffering I need to go through to follow you. But... So Ananias obeys the Lord and does what probably goes totally against his gut, his desire. And later Paul shows up with the apostles and they have the same response. They're terrified of him. How do we not know that he's not a spy? Maybe this is all part of a grand plan to take us all out. But they accept him in. They embrace him. See, if those two situations go differently, if, if Ananias or the apostles decide to treat Paul the way he should be treated for what he's done to them, then what? A quarter of the New Testament doesn't exist. I mean, have you ever been sinned against? I mean, like, really sinned against? Not like, you know, someone yelled at you. Or, I, mean, I mean, like, really, really, really. Like, total injustice. Completely takes your life off track. You ever experienced that? I mean, what's our knee-jerk to that person? Vengeance is mine, right? Actually, the verse says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But we like to grab that vengeance. Ananias, the apostles, they didn't grab that vengeance. They ministered to Paul. They reconciled with Paul. And because of that, I really believe that Paul looks at his life and realizes that he's received this extreme amount of grace and mercy that he doesn't deserve, but he received it. He received it from Jesus. He received it from that early church. And that grace and that mercy, it motivates him. And that motivation is what being a reconciling community is about. And he talks about it in verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no, lo no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. 
We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he said, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of his salvation. Picture Paul's motivation here. He was on the path to hell, to death. And, and Jesus knocks him off that path. And Ananias and the apostles help him stay on the path to life. So what was once death is now life. What was once old is now new. The new has come. And so he can't look at anyone else the way he used to look like. He can't look at people as enemies of God. Instead, he's looking at people who are away from God, who God wants to reconcile to and bring back to him. No matter who they are. No matter what they do. Because he realizes, and he talks about this later throughout Corinthians, first and second, that, that the sin he did far outweighed the mercy that he received. The amount of mercy he took to overcome the sin Instead, he wants a relationship with us. See, it, it, it amazes me that when Jesus knocks Paul off of his horse, Paul is going as a leader of a group of men who are going to kill Christians, and he knocks him off his horse, he scatters those around him, he makes him alone only to put him in relationship with Ananias, only to put him in relationship with the apostles, and in the process, bring him into the family. Jesus deals with our sin in the context of relationship. It starts with the relationship with him and then ends up with the relationship throughout the entire church. Jesus is looking to build relationship. But that's not the way of the world around us. The world we live in is about division. Think about that. It is so easy just to hop on that train of division. And the world is telling you who you should not like, who you should divide against, who is not a real person anymore. That's my favorite. The people who aren't like you are lizard people. That's what's coming out of the media and the internet, and that's straight from the pit of hell. Because what the enemy does, what he's always done when he's looking to divide people, when he's looking to, to bring us to a place, because he knows the only way to, to keep you away from the love of God is to kill you before you are able to accept Jesus. And the way the enemy in the past has knocked out complete people groups is by dehumanizing them. And he does the same with us. People are no longer people. Now they're labels. They're libs. They're conservatives. They're black. They're white. They're whatever label you want to be. I mean, even, even the things we joke about, right? Right? When we joke about how boomers or X's or millennials or Z's or whatever the new one is called, when we joke about what divides them from the rest of us, we're dehumanizing an entire group. They're no longer human. They're just a category. It 
It's so easy not to care about categories and labels, but there's a bigger calling here, a bigger responsibility. Through Jesus, we have been reconciled back to God. Following Jesus, pleasing Jesus, obeying Jesus, meaning that, meaning that we are called to continue that ministry of reconciliation, that we are ambassadors. We are called to help reconcile others to Jesus, no matter who they are or how far they are from God. So what does that look like for us? Notice what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you. I'm in the wrong book. Hold on. Ephesians 2, 14. My bad. That was 3. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we, have, we both have access to the Father through one spirit. We talked earlier about Jesus bringing the kingdom of God, bringing God's reign and rule into creation. The church is supposed to be the prophetic picture of that, of what God's kingdom looks like. See, notice how Paul describes it. Once we were separate, now we are, we are one. Once we were Jew and Gentile, but now we've been reconciled. We've been brought together. Where there was once hostility, now there is peace because Christ brought peace. You know, sometimes we get confused, the idea of peacemaker versus peacekeeper. You know, when, we sent, when, when they send peacemakers out there, they're, they're there to, to build relationships, to introduce people to one another, to help people understand one another. Peacekeepers are there to enforce the law. We haven't been called to keep the peace. We've been called to make peace. Our job is not to enforce or bring about God's reign and rule, but to invite people into God's reign and rule, to build relationships, to promote reconciliation with God and with others. And so why do we do outreach? To reconcile people with God. Why are we at the AYSO and doing it kind of a non-threatening way, we're just selling stuff, because we want people to see what following Jesus could look like and how it's not what they think it is. Why do we do outreach? Why do we do ministry last week like we talked about when we prayed for people? To reconcile people to God. I've asked Jeff this week to kind of chat about what that means to him. You got to come here to make the camera happy. We have to make the camera happy and stand here. Feed the camera. Yeah, don't trip that too. Um, we'll see where this goes. I jotted down a few thoughts yesterday. Um, a couple things come to mind when I think about this value of being a reconciling community. Um, I think this idea plays out on a, a few different levels. One is that we're to be reconciled to God, each of us individually. Um, but we're also to be reconciled to one another. Um, and I remember uh, Timothy Keller, before he passed away um, in an interview, he talked about how he, you know, he lived in New York, he was a pastor and author, um, and the uh, community that he pastored was very diverse. It was a large church in the middle of New York City. Um, and so he lived in this apartment building with a lot of different people, a lot of people who immigrated from other parts of the world. And he said, what the gospel of grace tells me is that I should fully expect that everyone I meet is going to be a better person than I am, that I am a sinner saved by grace. and." Everyone I meet, I should expect them to be, fully expect them to be better human beings than I am. That I'm just on a journey and so are they. Um, and that God is no nearer or farther away to them than he is to me and God loves them no, no more or less. 
Um, and so if that's the case, then I should fully expect that everyone I meet is somebody valued, somebody that I should be willing to learn from, that I should be humble in the presence of, that I should respect. Um, and, um, and so this idea of being a reconciling community means that we should appreciate each other's differences. When I first became department chair um, at the university where I teach, um, one of the things I constantly, I kept doing was apologizing to our office manager, our administrative assistant, because I would, I would give them the jobs that I didn't want to do and that I wasn't good at. And so I'm sorry, so I'd say, I'm sorry, here's a really crappy job. And then they were delighted to have that job. They enjoyed doing those things. And what I learned is that my weaknesses are other people's strengths and that I should value that. Um, I shouldn't apologize and think of that I'm thinking less of them because they can do something that I can't. Um, my title, my position, none of that had anything to do with anything. Um, they just had different gifts and strengths and that's what makes a body work. Um, Paul goes on to use that analogy of a body in, uh, he uses it in Corinthians, um, but throughout scriptures. Um, Jesus teaches that we are to not just love people who are like us, but love our enemies. Because at the end of the day, we're supposed to be a body. As Paul says, the hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. And, you know, where would the body be if it was all one thing? It wouldn't be a body. We wouldn't function. And that tells us a couple of things. One, it tells us that we're all different. We're all valued. But it also tells me that the only way I can figure out who I am is in the context of community. The eye doesn't know what it is until it's part of the face and the skull and the nervous, so it's all connected. How do I know what I am if I'm in isolation? Um, as an artist, and being an artist is probably the, the most individualistic profession imaginable. I was talking with some students the other day about graduate school, and essentially what you learn as an artist in graduate school how, is how to make your own work. That's it. I don't, you don't learn any skills, you don't learn, it's how do you make your own work? How do you as an individual find your voice? But the thing is, all of us who have gone to graduate school for art, the thing that we all talk about is the desire for community. That we can't figure that out if we're in isolation. We can't figure that out if our voice isn't in communication with anyone else. How do I know if I'm just babbling or if I'm saying something meaningful unless I'm actually talking to other people? And part of that is there's a long tradition of cultural history, other people who have made stuff before me that I am just contributing to, but also other people in, that are around me or living and give me feedback on whether or not what I'm making is meaningful in any way. Um, the last level, um, so I think we're supposed to be reconciled to God, to one another. Um, the other way we can be a reconciling community um, is being reconciled to the world. Um, and this happens on two levels. One is the idea of stewardship of the environment, creation care. You can read about all that if you want to. That's, you know, there's vineyard folks who talk about that as well as a lot of other people who have for a long time. That's nothing new, by the way, this idea of creation care, environmental stewardship, been around for a long time. Um, really is, you know, go back to the book of Genesis, it's there. Um, but also the idea of what uh, the artist Makoto Fujimura calls culture care, and that that is just as valuable. That in the beginning of the book, God gave us a garden, and that garden was just a small slice of possibilities within the midst of a wilderness. And God said, go and do likewise, this world is yours, make something out of it. Um, and we have, that's what human beings have done. That's what we do, we make culture, we make things. Um, science, all these professions we've made, that's what we do. And that's what God intended us for to. Diversity is God's idea. Um, he wants us to do different things and have different cultural expressions. Um, and so that kind of raises that question of whatever I'm contributing, whatever it's what I'm making or what I'm doing or what I'm consuming, is it contributing to the care and the stewardship of other people, of other lives? Is it contributing to the care of our common culture that we all share? Or is it just adding more trash to that toxic river? You know, every time I post something on social media, what is it doing? Is it lifting other people up? Is it valuing? Or is it tearing other people down? Um, 
you know, that's just one small example. You can, you know, think of anything that we create or consume. Is it giving life? Is it revealing the eternity that is to come? Is it adding to that picture of the kingdom of God? Or is it pointing the other direction? Um, and so that's something I wrestle with as an art, as a maker of culture. That's what artists do. Um, you know, it's something I have to constantly think about. Is it going to be valuable and helpful and useful? And all those things that Paul talks about in Philippians. Whatever is good, true, excellent, worthy of praise. You know, and so either as consumers, are we pointing to things and saying, yes, that is excellent. I celebrate that, regardless of whether or not my tribe made it or not. Is it excellent? Is it worthy of praise? Um, but as a creator, and we all create in small ways and big ways, am I creating a space that is hospitable and loving and that reflects the, the grace that's in the gospel of Jesus? So that's all I got. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to wrap up with a couple of things. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says that we are light to the world, that we are like salt. Light and salt transform everything that it touches. That's why the ministry of reconciliation is, is so important. There's a phrase that you'll hear every now and then, let me ramble out of my mouth, this idea of gospel saturation. How can we get the community we live in saturated with the gospel because I have this belief that if we saturate a community with the gospel as lives change as people become reconciled to God entire communities can be transformed not because of the good deeds we do not because of policies we enact not not because of anything other than the fact that the kingdom of God has come the reign and rule of God has come into individual lives and because of that it resonates out they become light and salt to their neighborhoods to their apartment buildings to their communities and it transforms the entire community we're seeing big Bits of that. I wish Kate was here because she started this little small group with a couple of neighbors and all of a sudden it's slowly doing something in her neighborhood. Cecilia's praying with a, about her apartment building and, and talking with a couple people and something stirring up in her apartment building. And there's no tremendous signs. We're not ready to write books about any of this stuff. But the Lord is there. He's beginning to move and lives are being affected. And you sit back and go, if this continues, it can turn an entire community on its head just because we went as ambassadors and reconciled people to God. I want to close with a picture. Everybody loves Revelations for some reason. I'm told I don't preach enough out of Revelations. You want to know what, uh, what the future looks like, what heaven looks like? John got to see it. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's not just what heaven is supposed to look like. That's what the church is supposed to look like. Every nation, tribe, people, language, including the people who we're not comfortable with. Ananias was not comfortable with Saul. But that can only happen if we're willing to join Jesus in the ministry of reconciliation. Let's stand and pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. Lord, I thank you for the work that you've already begun to do, Lord. I thank you for the, the little bit of work that's happening in, in, uh, in, in that little corner of DeKalb. I thank you for what's happening uh, in the apartment building down the block. Lord, I thank you for some of the things that are happening in some of the other neighborhoods that uh, that we have people in. Lord, I thank you. Uh, Lord, I'm going to just honor what, what uh, Brandon is doing in, in Glad Tidings with his silly little trolley taking it over to, to University Village and how that is stirring something there and how the gospel is being preached through that trolley. 
Uh, Lord, I thank you that, that you are working even today in reconciling our community and reconciling DeKalb and Sycamore and Cortland and Malta and Genoa and all of northern DeKalb County uh, to you. And Lord, I thank you that, that as you have ministered to us, as we've received grace, Lord, grace that we, we just did not deserve, uh, Lord, that you are giving us the ability to partner with you in that ministry of reconciliation. That you've given us the ability to act as ambassadors, not to enforce your kingdom, but to announce your kingdom, to invite people into relationship with you. Now, Lord, I just pray as we look down into the fall and through the future, Father, I just pray uh, for the th little things that you've already started, Lord, just begin to multiply that into each one of our lives. Father, I pray uh, just for uh, just Holy Spirit moments, for divine appointments to occur, for your kingdom just to not only uh, advance in our lives, but, Lord, in the communities around us, that, that just by being who we are, just by being salt and light, we begin to transform the places we live, that our neighbors are affected and drawn towards you, that they're reconciled to you, Lord. So come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come fill us. Come empower us. Come release us. I would be really remiss today if uh, I didn't say invite you uh, to be reconciled. Some people... Um, you know, it's easy to get into the, the thing of church without ever actually getting into relationship with Jesus. And so if, if you know, I grew up in the church, guys. I grew up every, I went to church every Sunday morning. I was an altar boy. I, I stared at that cross every every Sunday. I went to a parochial school. I had religious training since I was young. Every Saturday morning, I went to catechism growing up. But just knowing about God and having a relationship with Jesus are like two totally different things. And it's so easy just to know him in here without being in a relationship with him down here. And so I just want to invite you today, if, if, if you're sitting there going, I, I hear what Joe's talking about, but I've never experienced anything like that, then I want to invite you. Uh, turn, you know, come up as we wrap up today. Ask for prayer. Some of us, you know, it, it's been a rough road and we look back at the past, and the past was glorious, but the present isn't. And we wonder if we've missed it somehow. And the Lord's here today. He wants to reconcile that as well. So if that's where you are as well as we wrap up, you know, feel free. Come up, get prayer, or turn to the person next to you and just say, I need some prayer. Uh, if you need prayer for healing or anything else like that, get that as well. Otherwise, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Come get prayer if you need it. Have a great week. We forgot to announce this. There is a bonfire on Friday night at 7. Those are always fun to hang out at. If you've got nothing to do Friday night, stop on by. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon. Go to small group this week. Amen.